I'll start off this uh, presentation tonight just by putting this uh, picture of the blue marble up on the screen. And um, uh, this is a, a, a milestone image. It was the first photograph taken from space of planet Earth uh, that it covers the whole globe at one time. In other words, the point of view of where the picture was taken was between the Earth and the sun, so the whole globe is illuminated. Maybe some of you in this room are old enough to remember when this picture was taken. Does anybody have any guesses of where this picture was from? What's that? Yeah. Apollo 17, December 1972. The last mission to the moon, by the way. So um, what, what I will talk about tonight is climate science in the space age, which is how are we using satellites to study the Earth? And this is just some of my information. As Steve has already pointed out, my name is Gary Lagerlof. I'm an oceanographer by training, but I've merged my work more into climate research over the years. I work at a place called Earth and Space Research, which is about a mile away from here. We're a small nonprofit research organization composed mostly of oceanographers. And um, of course, this is science on tap. Now, NASA. Um, when, you, when people think about NASA, we think about the manned space flight program. You hear about space station. You hear about space shuttle. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Apollo program was a, was a great achievement for the United States and for NASA. But what people don't hear about much in the news is that NASA has a very ambitious Earth remote sensing program. This is just a pictogram of all the different Earth remote sensing satellites that are now in orbit around the Earth doing various kinds of studies of the Earth that are used for climate research and other kinds of studies. Several of these make measurements over the ocean in one way or another, and I've circled the ones that I'm going to be talking about tonight. There are about 20 satellites in total that are making Earth science measurements. So what do we measure from satellites? Well, I've broken it up into a few different categories. We measure things over the ocean, sea level, surface winds. From these, we can derive surface currents. We can measure surface temperature. Ocean salinity is coming soon. I'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. We can measure ocean color from space, which is an indicator of biological activity. For the cryosphere, that's the ice-covered part of the world. We can measure sea ice and ice sheet mass and ice sheet, ele ice sheet elevation. And there are a whole bunch of parameters from the atmosphere, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. But this is not even a complete list of all the things that satellites are telling us about the Earth. So one of the projects I've been working on for many, many years with NASA, from when I first started working with NASA in the late 1980s, is a program to measure sea level from space. And this uses a, a radar altimeter. Basically, it's the same kind of instrumentation that a, that a policeman might use to, to, to uh, monitor your speed as you're driving down the road. On this satellite here, which you see a picture of, there's an antenna on the bottom, which is pointed straight down at the Earth. It sends a radar pulse down, and by measuring the time it takes to go down to reflect off the sea surface and come back up, it very precisely measures its altitude above the sea surface. It's a very simple concept. Meanwhile, the satellite itself is tracked in its orbit using GPS systems that are on board. Between those two systems, you can actually calculate the exact height of the sea surface from the center of the Earth by differencing the height of the satellite from the center of the Earth from the, from the measurement that it makes with the radar system. And we can do that with a very high precision. As a matter of fact, from an altitude of about 1,300 kilometers in space, a satellite can determine sea level to within about two centimeters of accuracy, which is really a quite, a, quite a profound uh, level of precision. This map here is just taken from sea level data that was collected just a few weeks ago from this system. What you see in the color contours here are the range of sea levels as they depart from their average values. So we take out the mean sea level and we just look at the variations. And you can see that these are very small variations. The scale is in millimeters. So from the, from the lowest colors, which are the blue and the purples, to the highest colors, which are the reds and the whites, there's a difference of about 35 centimeters, which is about a foot. Okay? So that's the range of sea level variability that we can detect with one of these satellites. Well, what do we want to do with information like that? Well, it's actually useful for a number of things, and I'll get to that in a second. Another very important oceanographic measurement system we use from space is called a scatterometer. And this is uh, for measuring ocean winds. Basically, it's another type of radar system. If you look at the radar antenna on this satellite, it's not pointing straight down at the Earth. You'll see that it's pointed off at an angle. 
and it rotates around in circles. So as the satellite flies along, the scannerometer is scanning in a circular way, and it's making a circular track on the surface of the Earth. What it's doing is it's sending a radar pulse out and measuring the intensity of the reflection. And if the sea is really smooth, the radar pulse bounces off into space in the opposite direction, and there's very little echo coming back. But if the wind is blowing and the sea is rough, and there are a lot of waves and white caps, most of that energy is reflected back towards the satellite. So by measuring the, the intensity of the reflection, we can determine the strength of the winds at the surface. And because the thing is scanning as it moves along, it sees the same spot on the Earth from a couple of different angles as it moves. And from that, we can deduce both the direction and the intensity of the wind. So this is a map that you can see here of, of winds over, Southern Calif over Baja, California, from one measurement that was taken of a tropical storm in 2006. And you can see we can map out the whole wind field very precisely with this instrument. So our research group uses data from both of these satellites to actually calculate the surface currents. We combine the sea level data, which, tells, which gives us the, the pressure force, which tries to propel ocean, ocean surface currents along from high pressure to low pressure, or high sea level to low sea level, along with the winds, which provide a stress at the surface, which move the surface waters along. We combine those two together, and we can map out ocean surface currents. This is a map that, that you can go to our website, and you can, you can display these surface currents. On a, uh, every week, we update the maps. So this is from April 1st of this month. This is a map of the ocean surface currents over the tropical Pacific Ocean from our analysis. We use these data to track the relationship between ocean currents and El Nino, and other people use this data for shipping and for, for other kinds of applications. So this is one of the more practical things we do that's not directly related to climate research. So what I want to do now is change the subject a little bit and get away from sort of near-term measurements and look at some longer-term measurements. This is a, a chart that came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that was published last year in 2007, or two years ago now, in 2007. You probably heard a lot about this in the news. The IPCC is the intergovernmental body that that does an assessment every four or five years or so of the state of the climate. And, of course, the conclusion of those assessments is that the climate is warming up. Now, um, what I want to show you here is a couple of things. In this, in this report that was published in 2007, just let me show you, this is the deviation of temperature from the average value um, uh, computed over some period of time. Uh, as it, as it varied over the past 120, 130 years or so. So it was below some average value in the late uh, 1800s, and then during most of the 20th century, you can see it moved up and down. And then in the 1960s and 1970s, it started to increase temperature globally, started to increase very rapidly. So if you fit some slopes through these curves, you see that over longer periods of time, the rate of temperature increase seems quite moderate, but as you go further and closer and closer to the present, and you just fit curves during the last 30 years or so, you see that the slope is quite, uh, quite steep, and the temperature rate is now going up at about 0.18 uh, degrees centigrade, or about 0.32 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, which is about four times faster than it was over the last 150 years or so. Now, it's just in the last uh, 25 or 30 years since that Apollo 17 snapshot that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, since then, most of the satellites that we're using to monitor um, the state of the Earth from space have been developed and launched and are flying in space. So this is a fairly new and young program compared to NASA's program overall. Now, I'll go back to the sea level from space measurements that I talked about earlier. One of the most important pieces of information that we're obtaining from these radar altimeter measurements is the global average sea level change. The map I showed you before, I just showed differences of sea level that's gone up or gone down a little bit. But if we average the data over the whole globe and we track it over time from 1993 when this satellite series was first launched all the way up through the present, we see that there's a very distinct trend in global average sea level. Satellites are tracking this very precisely. And the present rate, if you just fit a line through these data, is about 33 centimeters per century. That's about one foot per century. That's how rapidly global average sea level is increasing right now, today, for the last 15 years. Now, about half of this sea level change 
scientists have calculated is due to water that's running off from the continents, from melting ice, alpine glaciers, and ice sheets, and so forth. And about half of it is due to what we call uh, thermosteric sea level change. What that is is that the, as the ocean warms up, it expands. Water expands as it heats up, and that expansion is also causing sea level to rise. So it's about half of it is due to fresh water coming in from the land as ice melts, and about half of it is due to thermal expansion of seawater. Now, if we take the data and look at a global map, we find out that the global average sea level is not rising uniformly over the whole globe. There are some areas that are rising more rapidly, and you could, this is now the 15-year trend. So in some areas, like the western tropical Pacific, the trend is much higher. And in other areas, like up here where we live, the sea level is actually going down a little bit. And most of this area that's covered kind of light green is right about at the average rate of sea level change, which is about 3.3 um, uh, millimeters a year or 33 centimeters a century. So just to give you an idea of the scale here, this scale range of colors is about roughly from minus a half an inch per year to plus a half an inch per year. And most of the sea level change is, is, is close to the average, which is this green color right here. But as you can see, there are some uneven uh, areas. And most of this area here in the tropical Pacific is due to the ocean is holding more heat. Okay? It's really it's warming up more in that area than in other parts of the globe. Now I'm going to talk about a different satellite system. This one is called GRACE, and that stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Now, the uh, reason I'm showing you a map of Washington here is that I want to use that as to illustrate how this GRACE satellite system works. It's basically designed to measure the very small changes in the gravitational field at the surface of the Earth. It basically is composed of two different satellites that fly in formation. They fly in the same orbit, one slightly ahead of the other, and they send radio signals back and forth to each other, and they track their separation distance as they move along. So as one of them moves along in orbit and it starts to feel an area of the Earth where there's a little bit more mass at the surface of the Earth, maybe a mountain range or something like that, it starts to accelerate ahead of the second one and it pulls ahead. And the two satellites are tracking their relative distance and they detect that. And then as the second one, as it passes that extra mass at the surface of the Earth, it starts to slow down while the second one starts to speed up. And so by constantly tracking their positions relative to each other and the motion relative to each other, these two satellites, the data that comes down from these satellites can be used to reconstruct through mathematical processing the gravitational structure of the surface of the Earth. So we can find all the gravity anomalies due to mountain ranges and valleys and so on. But this system is so precise that if you took an area about the size of the state of Washington and you flooded it with a layer of water that was about a centimeter thick, this system would tell the difference in gravity between before and after you covered it with water. Okay, just a, just a half a centimeter thick. That's how precise this system is. So what is the value of doing that? Well, we can use this information to track the redistribution of water around the planet. And one of the most important areas we're looking at are the ice sheets. So as the ice sheets melt, we can use this gravity data to determine how much mass is being lost from the ice sheets. So this is a reconstruction of, this is the continent of Greenland right here, and this is a reconstruction of the volume of ice change over Greenland from 2003 all the way up to 2008. So for the last five years, this gravity monitoring satellite system has been watching the ice volume decrease over time. Okay? Most of this decrease is coming from the southern part of Greenland. The, actually, the northern part of Greenland is fairly stable. And the equivalent, the amount that we're, we're, that's being lost is about 240 cubic kilometers of ice per year. And that's equivalent to about 6 millimeters a year of sea level rise. So if you remember the sea level rise I told you about from the altimeter data, the radar data, that rate was about 3.3 millimeters a year. This is 6 tenths of a millimeter a year, so it's about a fifth of the total sea level rise is accounted for just from the ice mass loss on the continent of Greenland. Greenland. So what's happening in, our, in Antarctica, we see something very similar. Most of the ice mass losses in the West Antarctic ice sheet, you've probably heard some things in the news about West Antarctica lately. This is the trend, also measured from the GRACE gravity satellite. 
The rate here is a little bit less, about 174 cubic kilometers per year, and that accounts for about a half a uh, millimeter per year of sea level rise or sea level change. So if you add up Greenland and, and Antarctica together, you come up with a little bit over a millimeter per year of sea level change, and that's about one third of the total just from these two places. So the gravity data that we're getting from this system and the sea level rise data that we're collecting from the radar system are very consistent with each other. Now. The, the, the next topic I'll talk about is the sea ice cover of the Arctic Ocean. Now, most of you know that the Arctic, which is the North Pole, is actually an ocean basin. It's surrounded by continents, Canada and, and Siberia and so forth, and Greenland, but it's actually an ocean connected to the North Atlantic through this strait right here. Now, uh, we've been monitoring with satellites since the late 1970s the sea ice cover over the Arctic Ocean, and, in, and it changes every season. It grows in the wintertime, it shrinks back in the summertime. The maximum ice cover is right about this time of year, in late March, early April, and the minimum usually occurs around mid to late September. So uh, this is, this is an, a diagram of the late summer, the, the September, sea ice cover over time, from 1978 through 2005. And as you can see, there was a steady downward trend Lots of ups and downs in this diagram, but it was decreasing over time. Then something really remarkable happened. Uh, 2005 was the minimum, but then 2007 popped along. Uh, there we go. 2007 came along, and it dropped precipitously, about 20% further in terms of sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean. Then in 2008, last summer, it bounced back up a little bit. But this, this is a very, very significant change in sea ice cover. These are just illustrations here of what it was in 2005, the previous low record that you see right here, versus 2007, which is now the lowest uh, on record. Now, there was a study that's, uh, there was actually an article today on the University of Washington uh, website about a study that's just been published. Uh, and uh, the, this is by a colleague of mine named Jim Overland. And they're now predicting that probably within the next 20 or 30 years, the Arctic Ocean will be free of ice in the summertime, completely free of ice. And the data that we're seeing from these satellites is very consistent with that. Um, in, in 2008, this is just a diagram of how the sea ice cover varies over the seasons during the summertime, June, July, August, September, October. This is the average curve right here based on the last 25 or 30 years of data. This is uh, the dash line is what it was in 2007, which was the lowest one on record. And in 2008, as you can see, it was very similar to that. Now I'm going to show you a movie, which I need to switch out of this and pull up the movie, just to give you an idea of how dramatic uh, this is. What, we, what you see here, let me get around to the... Something's wrong here. I'm not finding the bar to play it. Hmm. Excuse me a second. Uh, looks like we've got a hang up here on my computer, which isn't good. We could try this again after the break. I'll come, we can come back to that later. Let me get back to this so we can finish up the presentation. Okay, I'm going to change subjects on you one more time, and I'm going to talk about ocean salinity measurements from space, which is what we call the next uh, challenge for remote sensing of the ocean. This is the project, as Steve said, that I've been working on now for the last uh, uh, five or six years with NASA. Um, measuring ocean salinity from space has, has a number of important science applications. The basic thing we want to do is study the relationship between changes in the global water cycle and ocean circulation. Now what happens is that as ocean circulation varies, the 
it changes the amount of heat that's transported by the ocean from the equatorial regions to the higher latitudes. That changes weather patterns. That changes the patterns of rainfall and evaporation. That changes the salinity of the sea surface. The salinity of the sea surface, along with temperature, control the density of seawater. That impacts the ocean currents. That changes the way the oceans carry heat around. That changes the atmosphere. That changes the rainfall. So you see it's a coupled system. It's all linked together. What we're really missing is the ability to track these changes in salinity over time. We have other measurements. We can track sea surface temperature from space. We can do the ocean currents, as I showed you before. But we don't have the salinity measurements. And that's what the Aquarius mission was designed to do. This is a map of the uh, average salinity pattern of the sea surface. This is derived from about 150 years of conventional measurements from ships and, and buoys and other things, uh, the way oceanographers take data. And it's pieced together from a patchwork of observations that have been taken, uh, taken over a long period of time. But there's a couple of important features of the ocean that are, that are worth noting here. The colors here represent the concentration of salt in the water at the sea surface. We measure salinity in the ocean in units of parts per thousand. That's grams of salt in a kilogram of seawater. So a part per thousand is a tenth of a percent. So the average ocean salinity is about 35 parts per thousand, which is about 3.5% salt. Now, over here in the Atlantic Ocean, the colors are more intensely colored red. At the center of that area of the North Atlantic Ocean, the salinity is about 37. And uh, over here in the Pacific, it's around 35 here. And up off the Pacific Northwest in the North Pacific Ocean, it's as low as 32. So the range of salinity is about 32 to 37. And the average is about 35. But the fact that the Atlantic is saltier than the Pacific is very important for our climate. This diagram over here is what's called the conveyor belt diagram. It's sort of a wiring diagram for ocean circulation. And the way this works is that surface currents flow northward through the Atlantic Ocean join up with the Gulf Stream, flow up into the north, northern part of the North Atlantic Ocean, and then they lose heat to the atmosphere, and they cool off, and they sink towards the bottom. And then they flow back down through the basin of the Atlantic Ocean, and they join the circumpolar current. Some of it leaks into the Indian Ocean, some ventilates the Pacific Ocean, and it forms this conveyor belt circulation. The reason why it's important for climate is that this, this, this warm current brings a lot of heat up into the northern part of the northern hemisphere, it warms Europe and parts of Asia, and it keeps the climate of the northern hemisphere very mild. But if we get, if we, and, and the reason why this current and circulation is sustained is because this extra charge of salt that it gets when it goes through the North Atlantic Ocean picks up extra salinity there, and that makes it heavy enough to sink. There have been times in the geologic past when the water here got more fresh because inundation of fresh water from the Arctic Ocean or from the St. Lawrence. And that has basically disrupted this overturning circulation and has caused very, very rapid climate change in the past. So this is one of the most important processes that we intend to study using these Aquarius satellite data. This is a map down here of evaporation minus precipitation. In other words, we calculate how much rain falls onto the ocean and we calculate how much moisture the ocean gives back to the atmosphere by evaporation. And the difference between the two is evaporation minus precipitation. And the red colored areas are where our evaporation dominated. There's very little rainfall in those areas. And the blue areas are where are dominated mostly by rainfall and evaporation is a lot less. And as you can see, there's a correspondence between areas that are dominated by evaporation and areas that are high in salinity. But the Pacific is less salty than the Atlantic. So why is that? Well, the reason is, is that there's a a deficit of rainfall over the Atlantic. There's a lot more red relative to blue over here. Basically, more water is evaporated off the Atlantic Ocean than falls back in rainfall or comes back in terms of rivers. And that's carried by wind currents across Central America, and it's dumped as rain over here. So there's a pump, basically, that's carrying water out of the Atlantic Ocean and dropping it into the Pacific Ocean. And that's what keeps the salinity of the Atlantic Ocean higher, and that's what maintains this overturning circulation that we call the conveyor belt, so the whole thing is linked together. And studying salinity is one of the most important things we can do to really understand these mechanisms a lot better. So that's the work that we have for the future. This is a picture of the satellite, the Aquarius satellite. Uh, this is over Argentina. This is what it looks like here. This is a very, very, very large satellite. If it were standing vertically in this room, it would reach above the ceiling. This antenna right here is about 10 feet in diameter. 
It's a big piece of space hardware. It's being constructed right now at the Jet Propulsion Labs down in Pasadena, California. In a couple of months, the instrument is going to go down to Argentina where it's going to get mated onto the satellite, which is being built in Argentina, and then the whole thing is going to get launched in California in May of next year. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry about the movie. I'll try and get it fixed after the break. Thanks a lot. So I think we've got the video problem straightened out, so I will play this video. This is what I'm going to show you is a time lapse of satellite imagery over the Arctic Ocean from last year. It will start in January 2008, and I'll get you oriented here what you're looking at. The North Pole is right about here in the center of the picture. You can recognize the outline of Scandinavia over here. This is Norway and Sweden. This is all Siberia over here. This light gray area here is Greenland, and this is all northern Canada. Uh, you can see Alaska here, and this is the Bering Sea. And all this white stuff in the middle of the picture is sea ice. Now, as I start the thing playing, this will step through all the way through the summer and stop at the end of August. And what, you, what I want you to pay attention to is what happens to the sea ice cover. Now, you see these, these light streaks here? These are clouds. You'll see these move quickly across the image as it goes through the time lapse. So just try to ignore those and pay attention to the sea ice cover itself and what happens. And in the dark spaces that you'll see will be open water, open seawater. This is a uh, 86 gigahertz channel. Okay. So off we go here. So it's starting to play. So we're stepping through January now. And we're into February. So this is about what it would probably look like right now, all right? This is the first week of April. So we can watch it step through the rest of the year for 2008. You start to see breakup taking place along the northern coast of Alaska and Siberia. Now watch what happens as we were in July now. Watch what happens as we go through July and August. Okay. So this is the end of August last year, 2008. Normally, uh, according to the 20-year average, the sea ice would be all the way around the perimeter here, and there'd be maybe a few open leads along north of northern part of Alaska or Siberia. Now about half of the sea ice cover of the Arctic is completely gone at the end of the summer. You want to see it again? Yeah. Okay, we'll play it again. So that's, that's the state of the Arctic. And as I said, now models are predicting that the Arctic Ocean will be ice-free at the end of the summer within the next couple of decades. Might even be sooner than that, based on some of the trends that we're seeing right now. So you can, this, Im this image was uh, taken uh, from a website that's uh, maintained at the University of Illinois. It's called Cryosphere Today. If you want to write that down, you can search for it on the web. And you can see uh, other years as well. They have time-lapse videos like this from other years as well. 